Even though the atmosphere at a given time may not be showing a great display of activity, you cannot be too sure that the atmosphere is stable. A bucket of water bouncing off top of a slightly open door, waiting for you walking through, may appear to be stable. However, with just a small nudge, you quickly understand how unstable that bucket really is. You can think of our unstable atmosphere in much the same way as the bucket balance on the door. The term stable means the atmosphere is in the state that is resisting to change. An unstable atmosphere may be in the balance, but not at all resistant to change. A little push in the right direction, in this case up, may produce all the change necessary to sustain vertical motion, causing turbulent mixing and the production of storms. Here we will review a few mechanisms which serve as a catalyst that can bring about the changes. The first one is the orographic lift in the air, when the air in motion reaches a barrier that it cannot go through or around, and often goes over it. We see it is in nature when the air lifts over a mountain. This process of a parcel or a layer or air, of air rising as a result of a topographic is referred as orographic uplifting. So, as the air lifts over a mountain, the temperature decreases according to the dry adiabatic the collapse rate until reaching the lifting condensation level (LCL). Above the LCL, the temperature decreases according to the moist adiabatic collapse rate. If the temperature of the rising air decreases faster than the lapse rate of the air around, the environmental lapse rate, then the parcel will continue to rise only as long as it is its force from below. A parcel of rising air that cools at a slower rate than the environmental lapse rate will continue to rise as a result of its buoyancy. We shall see it is later on the comparison lapse rate. The orographic leap, because oro means mountain. Another one is the convergence, that can force the air near the surface to rise. If winds blow in different directions meet each other, the different moving air masses become an obstacle to one another. The air converges and there is no place to go but upwards. At the surface air flows inward in the center of low pressure where it converges and then rises. Convergence also occurs when the air flowing over a smooth surface suddenly hits a rougher surface and slows due to increased friction. The air piles up on the rough surface where the friction is greater, and this causes some of the air to move in the vertical direction. So imagine the air comes from the ocean, a very smooth surface which any coastal area creates this effect. We have mentioned many times how the radiation emitted by the Earth hits the air at the surface. When the warm air rises, it may cool adiabatically, mean without the exchange of heat between the parcel and the surrounding air. The temperature drop is responsible to change in pressure. In contrast, we refer to the heating that occurs by the radiation as convectional lift. In the case of convectional lift, the temperature of the air changes, at least in part, in response to heat that is added by radiation. The air expands and warms, making it less dense than its environment. Because less dense materials are more buoyant, the warm air produces the call a thermal. The frontal one is the final lifting mechanism which we discuss is the overriding of air or frontal boundaries. So you, you just learn about different types of air masses. So when the air mass has certain temperature and moist characteristics. In fact, these characteristics are based on categorized air mass. You learn about the continental polar air mass, the continental tropical. So likewise, moist air, because it's less dense, will override dry air. But how is this different from convergence? In the case of convergence, the lifting results from air molecules pushing one another upward, like pushing two small piles of sand together with your hands, forcing a large pile to form. When two frontal boundaries meet, the lift that occurs is due to relative buoyancy to the two air masses. 
the more buoyant air mass will override the less buoyant air mass. So the buoyancy is determined by the characteristic of the air mass, temperature and moisture content. So you can have two situations, a cold front and a warm front. A cold front exists when the cold air following warm air undercuts the warm air, having it upward with a more violent thrust compared to the steady rays of air at the warm front. The air associated with the cold front is usually unstable and conducive to cumulonimbus formation. Because the up thrust is delivered along a boundary between the two air masses, the cumulonimbus forms a well-defined line in contrast to the well-spaced clouds forming during the thermal convection. Usually, rainfall associated with cold front is the form of a heavy deluge. More rain may fall in a few minutes as the cold front passes than during the whole passage of the warm front. As the cold front passes, the clouds roll by and the air temperature by become noticeable cooler. So the other one is a warm front when the warm air is raising over cold air. In vertical cross sections, the boundary takes the form of a gradual slope, roughly 1 by 100, and lifting in the slow but persistent. As the air lifts into regions of lower pressure, it expands, cools, and condenses water vapor as flat layers of clouds, autostratos, from which rain can start to fall once cloud has thickened it to about 2500 meters from the ground. Cloud continues to lower towards the boundary at ground level, known as the surface front. This lower level cloud is called stratus or nimbus stratus, from which appreciable amounts of rain may fall. Sometimes nimbus stratus cloud may be the only a few hundred meters above the ground and can completely cover hilltops and mountains. Mid-latitude cyclones, also called extratropical cyclones, form at the polar front when the temperature difference between two air masses is large. These air masses blow past each other in opposite directions. Coriolis effect deflects winds to the right in the northern hemisphere, causes the winds to strike the polar front at an angle. Warm and cold fronts form next to each other. Most winter storms in the mid latitudes, including most of the United States and Europe, are caused by mid latitude cyclones. The warm air at the cold front rises and creates a lower pressure cell. Winds rush into the low pressure and creates a rising column of air. The air twists, rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere, since the raising air is most rain or snow falls. Mid latitudes Cyclones forming winter in the mid latitudes and moving eastward of the westerly winds. These two to five day storms can reach 1000 to 2500 kilometers, around 625 to 1600 miles in diameter, and produces winds up to 125 kilometers, pretty much 75 miles per hour. Like tropical cyclones, they can cause extensive beach erosion and flooding. Mid-latitude cyclones are especially first in the mid-Atlantic and New England states, where they call nor'easters, because they come from the northeast. About 30 nor'easters strike the region each year. So during the initial stage of the cyclone's life, also known as a cyclogenesis, a boundary separates opposite fronts of cold and warm air. When the upper level disturbance moving over the front, it causes a wave to form. Cyclonic shear begins to occur when the warm and cold front slides against one another, generating the spinning motion characteristic of cyclones. The meeting of cold and warm air creates precipitation, which is heaviest near the border of the front. During the mature stage, cyclones the waveform during the initial phase grows as a warm air replaces the space between behind by the moving cold front, and the organization for both of the cold and warm fronts increase. The cold front moves faster than warm front, intensifying the cyclonic circulation. 
The system's lower pressure is located at the center of the wave and the cyclone's wind are stronger, about 8 miles above the ground. Occlude stage is the mid-latitude cyclone's third stage. The denser cold front catches up the warm front. Because the warm air isn't dense enough to displace the cold air ahead of it, it shifts up and slides above the cold air at its path. This action eventually forms an occluded front, in which the wave transforms into a loop, which is narrower and the base and cuts off at the supply of the warm air. The final stage is the dissolving stage, occur, occur when the loop formed by the cold front boundary surrounded the lower pressure pocket of warm air close. This cuts off the supply of warm moist air and the lifting force caused by the interactions between the cold and warm front. The loss of convergence and uplift mechanisms cause the cyclone to dissolve, and the low-pressure system gradually stabilizes.